So this is basically a very nice story about how one tiny island can make a big difference in, in the current climate. And because of its geology and geography and geometry, it has evolved over time. So it has also potentially affected uh, very significant biological events and climatic events in the past. So the story was basically built over uh, several years, uh, started by Chris Karnauskas when he was a PhD student with us and now he's a faculty at U Boulder and the other people like Breck Owens, Eric Mittelstadt and, and Antonio Busalaki are also involved in this. So I don't know how many of you have paid attention to uh, the Galapagos. Here is a map of the Pacific for example. Uh, how many of you can even find Galapagos on this, right? It's a tiny little island sitting here. Just because of its position, which is in the current configuration touching the equator, it can affect ocean circulation and hence the impact of ocean circulation is big enough so it can also affect climate in the current condition. And it turns out that the island is not stationary in the sense over geologic times, its geography and geometry change. I will discuss more about that. So it turns out that in the current configuration, it's also being affected by global warming in a counterintuitive way, which affects penguins and creates what is generally referred to as a biological loophole in nature's rules. So we'll look at one quick example of that. And it reinterprets what has been interpreted in the past as permanent El Nino conditions, which was potentially relevant for human evolution, which I will discuss. And it turns out that maybe that was a misinterpretation. So doing a geologic model and some biological model, you can show that the Galapagos Island actually has had lot of important local effects, which can then be amplified to global scales because of the atmospheric response to circulation changes. So looking at what is happening right now, if you look at the current Galapagos archipelago, which is a group of islands, it's about 100 islands and islets, big and small, as you can see the, the distribution over here. And the Isla Isabella, which is the largest one, is actually barely touching the equator, as you can see here. It crosses the equator by about a quarter degree to the north, so it's about 25 kilometers to the north of the equator. And I'll show in a minute that that makes a huge difference. And all these islands are present today, but in the past, they would not have been there. So we'll go through some geologic modeling to show how the system evolves and why it evolves. As it is now, it's obviously full of biodiversity. Darwin, when he was traveling on the Beagle, for example, was parked here for several months. Darwin was very sick on the ship. He used to get seasick all the time. So he was very happy when they were staying here for three months. And during his stay here, he had lots of epiphanies about how evolution may have happened uh, by looking at the uh, the finches that live there and the size, small differences in the size of their beaks based on which island they were living on or the iguanas or the tortoises and the geckos. He made lots of theories about evolution right here. So the marine iguana that's being shown here, for example, lives on multiple islands. Genetically, they are different. But if you look at the nose to tail length right now, that actually depends on the tidal height between the different islands where they live. It turns out that they feed on algae, they dive into the water and feed on the algae that grow on the rocks. And the tides determine how high the water is. So they adjust their body size to be able to feed and survive in these complex island configurations. And when El Nino comes, the upwelling is reduced, as I will show later on, which means the nutrient supply is reduced and the algae biomass is reduced, so their food supply is reduced. So they manage to shrink their body size by about 50% to survive reduced food supply. So this is a very unique set of islands, which is now a World Heritage Site. Biodiversity is being preserved and so on. So let's look at a little bit the ocean circulation and climate right now. Yes. So this uh, change in rate of 50 percent, that's happening over? Uh, it happens basically over a few months. So, so El Nino comes, yes. With the, so El Nino basically lasts for about 9 to 12 months. 
So within that period, they are immediately able to shrink their body size, survive the El Nino and then come out of it when a La Nina or when the food supply returns to normal, then they can get back to their normal body size. Okay? So they do it on what is called interannual time scale or multi-year time scales. Okay. Is there any specific name to this phenomenon of shrinking their body? I am not aware, but we can check on that. I, the biologists may have a specific word for it, but as far as I know, it's just uh, a process that happens. We can find a word for it if there is one. So how does the circulation work? So here we are looking at a cross section of the Pacific Ocean. On the west, you have uh, Asian landmass and Australia, New Guinea and so on. On the east, you have here North America, Central America and South America. The trade winds blow from the northeast and the southeast. And what happens is when you push the water westward because of the winds, because of the Coriolis effect, which means the earth is rotating, you have a, like you are standing on a merry-go-round, you, you feel pushed by the circulation, uh, by, by the rotating of the uh, merry-go-round. Same thing happens on the planet. So when the water is pushed to the west, from east to west, the water to the north of the equator is pushed to the right of the direction of motion and to the south of the equator it is pushed to the left of the direction of motion which means as the water is moving west it is moving away from the equator like as if Moses parting water for example. So colder water which is below the surface comes up, colder water has more nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, iron and so on. So whenever there is water coming up we call it upwelling and that upwelling and the associated nutrients obviously drive more productivity which is why you have such rich biodiversity in this region. So typically you end up with cold temperatures in the east and as the water is pushed to the west, it is being warmed by the atmosphere, it piles up in the west. So if you look at around, uh, we will see a little bit later on another figure which shows the sea surface temperatures. If you look around uh, New Guinea, Australia, Indonesia and so on, there is very warm waters there, hence you have things like uh, uh, the Great Barrier Reef because corals can grow in these warm waters and so on. So wherever there is warm water, the air warms up, it rises, takes moisture with it. So you can see this rising motion here uh, and that then moves eastward and northward. It creates these so-called cells, one is called the Walker cell, the other one is called the Hadley cell. So we will come back to that a little bit later on. So you can see that as the water is pushed, the water piles up on the west. So the sea level actually going from east to west increases by almost half a meter from the coast of Galapagos to the coast of New Guinea for example. So when you pile up water like that, you have a pressure gradient going in the other direction. So water wants to go down the pressure gradient in the other direction. But because near the surface you have winds pushing water westward, the water can only go eastward below the surface forming this nice ribbon of current going all the way from the Australian coast to the South American coast. Okay? That is called the equatorial undercurrent or referred to here as EUC. So the main idea is that if the EUC is wanting to go east and if you put an island in the way, then the water that is coming east is going to basically come up. So it basically means it will increase the upwelling when it hits the island. So that is why it becomes critical to see if Galapagos exists, whether it is touching the equator because this is equatorial undercurrent which is trapped to the equator. So if there is an island blocking it, then you will change the ocean circulation, you will change the sea surface temperature, you will change the biology and we will see a little bit later on that potentially you can also change El Nino and so on. So we will explain each part uh, separately, but this is the basic configuration, yes. So these, the depths are in meters, is it? So these are all shallow? Here, yes, sorry. This is the depth that is being shown down to 300 meters and we are looking at a cross section going across the Pacific. And these colors are anomaly, these basically these are, anomaly. Yes. So these are basically trends. In this case, we are looking at ocean temperatures, how they are warming. So in the east, we are warming the temperature by about one and a half degrees per decade. On the east, there is less warming, maybe even a little bit of cooling 
and this is related to how the ocean and the winds respond to global warming. We won't get into that, we'll have a separate lecture on that, but that's essentially what is being shown here. That's the ocean temperature trends in degrees per decade. So if it is a shallow current that is coming up because of the you know, barrier of those islands, then it, will it bring in still nutrients? Yes, so we'll, show, we'll see that anything that comes up from below the surface, the nutrients are increasing as you go away from the surface because there is no biology, there is no light. So you are accumulating the nutrients. So every time you upwell and bring that water, you will bring <coughs> nutrients back up to the surface. Okay, very good question. So this is just another cross section of depth in meters down to 400 meters and a section that is going from 10 degrees south to 20 degree north uh, at 125 west which is west of the Galapagos, 110 west which is also west of the Galapagos and 90 west which is to the east of Galapagos between Galapagos and South America for example. And it clearly shows that near the surface you have blue colors which are currents going westward away from you. For example, if you are standing on Galapagos and looking towards Australia, those currents are getting going away from you whereas this equatorial undercurrent below the surface is coming towards you. Okay? So the equatorial undercurrent is clearly visible to the west of the Galapagos at two locations whereas when you go to the east of the Galapagos, obviously that current has been blocked. Okay? So we are basically going to look at what is the physical impact on ocean circulation how does the atmosphere respond to this ocean circulation change and what does biology do? So you look at it in the current climate and then you see what the, the Galapagos configuration may have been in the past and how the past circulations would have been affected by the Galapagos and if those circulation changes had any impact on biology at the time. Okay? Yes. The last one which is uh, to the west of Galapagos. So even uh, if you look at like 100,000 kilometer away from Galapagos, even there the currents are weak. So is it because they are nearer to the continent or is it because of the island? Yeah, so we are uh, basically the uh, equatorial undercurrent gets to about 1, 1 and a half meter per second. In the ocean, remember the currents are always few centimeters per second. Ocean moves like molasses. It's very heavy water, the density is high but its heat capacity is high. So the currents are always slow, but some of these currents like the equatorial undercurrent, they can get over 1 meter per second. So it is definitely getting slower as you get closer to the island because it senses it and then it has to go up uh, as it hits the island. Okay? So this is just one example of uh, the work that showed that when you look at sea surface temperatures around the Galapagos, this is looking at temperatures from 1982 to 2014, so about uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, it turns out that when you look at the trends of sea surface temperatures that are shown here, that while the rest of the ocean is warming, global warming is happening, because of this uh, impact of the equatorial undercurrent hitting the Galapagos and the upwelling increasing, the response around the Galapagos uh, appears to be a cooling as opposed to a global warming. Okay? So that can be easily shown that from satellite data and from you know, me temperatures measured within the ocean that the temperatures have cooled significantly over the last 40 years around to the west of the Galapagos, not to the east. And it has created what is called a biological loophole as I mentioned because the Galapagos penguins which are the northernmost penguins on the planet, all the penguins are in the southern hemisphere, these are the ones that come so close to the, the equator. They have actually expanded their habitat because they like temperatures around 23 degrees centigrade, that's where the maximum productivity for their food happens. So as the temperature has cooled and the area of 23 degree temperature has expanded around the Galapagos, the habitats of the Galapagos penguins has expanded, the number has gone up which is very good news because they were actually being, uh, they were on an endangered list. Uh, people visited, they introduced rats on the islands, they were eating the eggs of the penguins, there was perturbation, pollution, etc. So the penguins were actually uh, almost going ex extinct. But because of this 
biological loophole in global warming. Nature is responding to global warming in one way, but because of the local interaction of ocean circulation with the island, the habitat of the penguins is, is in actually expanding and the number of penguins is actually going up. So, you always have to pay attention to how the biology responds. If we want to expand that to now look at the some of the biodiversity, for example, here uh, I am showing a figure of the giant tortoises uh, that are very famous on the Galapagos. They can get really big, several tons, huge. And what is being shown here is again the longitude around Galapagos, the latitude going from one north to one south and these are the current islands. So, wherever there is no shading that means the tortoise has gone extinct by now. Okay? What is shown in the parenthesis here for example is the age of the island. So, one thing you can see immediately is that as you go from east to west the islands get younger. So, San Cristobal here is 2.4 to 4 million years old, Santa Fe is about 3 million years old, Española is 3 to 3 and a half whereas, if you come to Fernandina it is barely 350, uh, 35,000 to 70,000 years old, Isabella is half a million to 0.8 million years old and so on. Okay? And the name written here in italics is basically name of the tortoise species. Okay? Why is this important? Basically because somehow tortoises got to the Galapagos, we do not know exactly how that happened or uh, when that happened, but they have been around for many million years. But over time on different islands you can find different species in what is called phylo phylogenetic diversification. Okay? So, if the sea level changed or island configuration changed and the island bridges changed, they could have dispersed in the sense they could have physically moved from one island to another and then something called vicariance happens where the islands get separated and then geographically they are kept apart for, uh, for a long time, then essentially genetically they become different species. Okay? So, they are genetically identical. So, it turns out that there is some data that shows that when you look at tortoises and geckos and lizards and so on, there has been a phylogenetic diversification around 1.6 million years ago. Okay? And it turns out that there is other physical evidence that shows that maybe a temperature gradient change from the Galapagos to Australia happened around the same time. So, people use these multiple evidences to argue that the nature of El Nino changed around 1.6 million years ago. Okay? And the rest of the work I will show that actually when the islands move or appear and cut off the circulation around the equator, then the equatorial undercurrent hits the island, increases the upwelling. So, locally temperature changes happen and people have misinterpreted it as a change in the large scale gradient and a change in El Nino and so on. Okay? So, that also can explain other things as to how the vicariance around that time would have come around and so on. That is the main story uh, to look at. So, in terms of going to evolution, uh, just to touch on how it relates to human evolution. So, if you look at this figure which is showing time going back from present to about 40 million years ago, you can see that our common ancestors split into new world monkeys and old world monkeys around 30 million years ago, maybe due to climate change, maybe due to some uh, continental drift or some sort of uh, geologic event and the old world monkeys still exist. The new world monkeys then began to split and basically our ancestors, hominoids or our relatives before gorillas came around 3 to 5 million years ago. Somewhere here the split happened. So, this period is critical. So, somewhere here climate change seems to have happened and the aridification of East Africa seems to have happened and that seems to have played a big role in human evolution. How? Basically you look at again age going back from the present to about 5 million years ago. These are African climate variability indices which show that 
when I will show the orbital uh, configuration next, you have the earth's orbit basically having a tilt which we call obliquity and it has a shape of the uh, orbit which is elliptical, but the ellipticity changes right that has a, a time scale of 100,000 years and its precession or when the equinoxes actually happen changes because of the gravitational pull of other planets the orbit kind of shifts around. So, those have each individual time scales. So, precession of the equinoxes has a time scale of around 23 uh, kilo years, 23,000 years. The obliquity has a cycle of 41,000 years. We do not have to worry about it right now, but basically if you look at paleo proxies which can tell us through some geochemical approaches how temperatures have changed. You can see that if you go to 5 to 3 million years ago, it seems like temperatures have been changing at the precession time scale. Somehow then they switch to look like they are changing over obliquity time scales and more recently in since the 1.6 million year change, they are changing on a ellipticity time scale. So, delta O18 here basically refers to uh, the, the isotopic uh, composition of oxygen. So, oxygen we always think of as O16, but it has an isotope which has 8 neutrons in uh, 10 neutrons instead of 8. So, you have O18. So, a very small fraction of water has H2O18 instead of H2O16. And because of the uh, energy difference in evaporating and precipitating H2O16 versus H2O18, uh, you end up leaving a signature in the ocean when the evaporation and precipitation change or sea level changes for example. Basically that happens by building large glaciers on land uh, during the ice ages when you take out a lot of water from the ocean and put it on land and freeze it into glaciers that leaves an O18 signature in the ocean and so on. So, we can go and take a sediment core from the ocean and measure changes in O18 and interpret uh, past temperature changes or ice volume changes. This is called paleo proxy because even though we are saying it is temperature, it is actually a proxy for temperature. It is not a direct thermometer measurement of, of temperature. Okay? So, there is also a signature on something called delta C13, which is again a carbon isotope. So, carbon also has C12, C13 and C14 isotopes and just as O18 and O16 are energetically different, C13 and C12 are energetically different. So, when plants photosynthesize, they preferentially synthesize more C12, but if climate change happens and carbon increases or decreases, then the amount of C13 they take up changes. And also it turns out that some plants like grasses do better than trees in surviving with a different temperature and CO2 level. So, this measure here shows that something happened around 1.5 to 2 million years ago, which increased the grassland over East Africa. Okay? So, we are slowly seeing that there are multiple evidences of a climate change around 1.6 million years ago. If you look at human evolution, so our old ancestors before Homo lineage evolved were people like Kenyanthropus and Ardipithecus and Australopithecus and so on. They split around 3 million years ago and two lineages developed. This one basically went extinct and our ancestors like Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, Homo erectus and so on, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, they all appeared during this time and basically Homo sapiens appeared somewhere between 2 million years ago and 1 million years ago, maybe more recently, but Homo erectus definitely ar appeared around that time. Uh, we can go and look at uh, our ability to make stone tools and so on from the past and infer a lot of these kind of evolutionary lineages. Right? So, what is the relation between uh, climate change as seen in ocean temperatures, in vegetation and in human evolution? Does it have anything to do with Galapagos at all?
right. So, it is a bit speculative, but if you show that Galapagos in fact has had an impact, then you can begin to argue that maybe it is not just very good for biodiversity now, but potentially played a role in human evolution in the past. So, this is just to reinforce some of the points. So, this is the ellipticity of the orbit which changes on a 100,000 year time scale. This is the precession of this is just showing a wobbling of a top, but there is also a precession of the equinoxes which changes on 19 to 23,000 year time scales and the obliquity changes or the tilt changes on 40,000 year time scale. So, what the animation that is shown here, the lower left corner that is the precession. You can see that the orbit is slowly tilting. So, basically that means it determines how far earth is when summer happens, ok. So, precession basically determines the intensity of the summer and using Kepler's law obliquity determines how long the summer lasts. So, you could have a summer far away from the sun, but then because of Kepler's law earth is moving slower. So, the summer lasts longer. So, the integrated energy is more. So, high intensity summer can have less integrated energy because the earth is moving faster when it is closer to the sun. So, these things make a big difference in terms of how much ice you can build on the planet and so on, ok. So, this is another figure that is going back in time paleoclimate people usually show the axis going backwards. So, the present is here, this is 15 million years ago. This is a longitude uh, sorry latitude uh, focused on East Africa so going from 5 south to 15 north and this is showing change in uh, kind of the forests that existed there ok. So, before 10 million years ago there was more open woodland and some climate change happened around 10 million years ago which may be related to uh, something like opening of the Panama Canal for example, the isthmus of Panama or the onset of the monsoon rise of the Himalayas uh, which produced more rain over East Africa for example. So, you ended up with lush green forests somewhere between 10 and 5 million years ago. So, the theory is that the chimpanzees and our ancestors that evolved around this time were basically quadrupedalist which means they walked on all four limbs, right. Because they had lot of food and they had lot of places to hide, they did not have to move very fast. It turns out that quadrupedalism is actually much slower than bipedalism, which means when we stand up and, and walk or run, we can run much faster, endurance is longer and so on. So, you think a horse can run faster than us, but actually a human being can outrun a horse, human beings can keep running much longer than a horse, ok. So, the idea one of the best theories we have is that some climate change that happened around 2.5 or to 1.5 million years ago changed the vegetation from lush green forests into grasslands and savannas which are much more open. So, the, the chimpanzees had to run much further if they were being chased and they had to go further to find food because you lost the lush green forest. So, this somehow led to bipedalism. They figured that they must run faster. So, they started walking upright and then it changed the connection between the spine and the brain and probably also a shift in diet happened. We mastered the fire, we started cooking more dense protein cooked food etcetera which released the jaw muscles probably this is the theory. It allowed the cranium to grow bigger and then there is something called Balvinian evolution where the more you use the brain the sharper it gets, the bigger it gets. So, you had left and right brains evolving. We became better at using our hands because of opposable thumbs. So, you end up building lots of theories based on one uh, hypothesis that bipedalism was somehow related to East African aridification, ok. So, multiple theories exist as to how the East African aridification happened. The opening of the isthmus of Panama was one that was proposed that somehow that changed ocean circulation and climate, but that happened actually uh, about 4 to 7 million years ago. So, that was before the this event that we are talking about which is much more recent 1.5 to 2 million years ago. 
the other theory came from knowing that Australia is actually moving northward at almost three centimeters per year. So, so three million years ago, it would have been much further south. So it slowly drifted north and somewhere around two million years ago, it blocked the passage between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean and that changed the temperature in the Indian Ocean and the temperature in the Pacific Ocean and the cooling of the Indian Ocean can presumably create a drier climate on East Africa. So they argued that this change in circulation related to the closing of the Indonesian passage probably led to the aridification of East Africa and evolution of human beings. That is still debated. So the theory that I am going to propose here with this work is basically to look at various aspects and argue that that is a local change, but still it can come through El Nino. So I will show several results to build this story. So here is the sea surface temperature distribution. So it is cold in the east because of this water moving away from the equator and upwelling happening. Water is piling up and getting warmed up here. So this is called the warm pool and this is called the cold tongue for obvious reasons. So when the water comes up from the ocean and heat is being taken up by the ocean to create this warm pool, basically ocean is creating a pool of heat over several years and something happens once in a while and this water gets released and moves this way and warms this region and creates huge floods and rain on this side which is what we call El Nino. We do not know exactly why it happens or how often it happens and what triggers it and so on. There are a lot of details we will look at in another lecture. But essentially this east-west temperature contrast is very basic for the El Nino process. Okay? The other thing to remember is that as I said, if you look at the heat flux for example from the atmosphere into the ocean, when you have cold water, the atmosphere tries to heat it. So there is heat going into the ocean and over long time scales, this heat is not only warming the temperatures here, but it is also being moved by the currents to these latitudes here. And here the ocean becomes warmer than the atmosphere. So the ocean is losing the heat back to the atmosphere. So essentially that means there is some kind of a heat balance going on where you have putting heat here and taking it out here. Okay? So putting heat here is, is dependent on having upwelling cold water closer to the surface. So this is significant because this heat is being moved here and lost to the atmosphere. So if you have an ice age and you end up building lot of ice on the ocean for example and you block the heat loss from the ocean, then this part has to adjust itself and stop taking up so much heat because it cannot get rid of it here. So you can change the sea surface temperatures and the contrast here either locally by changing circulation or by building ice. Okay? So I will focus on how tropics can uh, affect this change. And this is showing basically the distribution of rainfall. Wherever there is warm water, you have evaporation and precipitation. So you have a lot of rain. Wherever there is cold water, you have less evaporation and less rain. We will not focus here for now, but Indian Ocean is very warm. We have a lot of rain, monsoons, etc. And East Africa also has a little bit of rain, uh, not as much as here, but it has uh, some rain, but it is right now basically a dry land, uh, savannas, grasslands and so on. So how would this have worked? Let me skip this part and show where the ocean sediments are collected. There is an international program called the Ocean Drilling Program which name might have changed by now. But they go in the ocean and they drill into the bottom of the ocean several kilometers long sediment cores. These sediments are basically collecting signatures of isotopes from the biology near the surface. So when phytoplankton forms shells for example, the shells will keep the signature of maximum, mag magnesium to calcium ratio or the alkenones they are synthesizing as polymers and these 
depend on the temperature. Okay? When they sink to the bottom and they are stored for many millions of years, you can go and see the change in time and you can say how the temperature has changed over time by looking at those sediments. So Papal basically looked at sediments from the west and sediment from the east and tried to say how temperature changed in the past okay? and whether it changed gradually or suddenly uh, and so on. So this is the story that has been around for a long time. It is called the Pliocene paradox that is the shift of 1.6 million years ago and you can see that here. So the west equatorial Pacific temperature is shown in the red curve here going from about 5 million years ago to the present and you can see that it has remained almost the same, the red line and the blue line shown here is from the East African, uh, uh, sorry, East Pacific location and you can see that it seems to be very close to the value of the West Pacific till here and then suddenly somewhere around 2 to 1.5 million years ago, it seems to cool. Okay? So the, but they looked at other cores from uh, California and South uh, America and uh, South Africa and so on and showed that they show a gradual cooling. Okay? So the entire argument has been about this shift here. Is, did this shift happen suddenly and if so, does that mean that the temperatures were fairly uniform across the Pacific like this? Okay? So this is basically not much cold water across the Pacific. In the today's climate, it is 5 to 8 degrees cooler than here, but some people have argued that it was warmer than present, but not as warm as this. Okay? So essentially, was there really a permanent El Nino, which basically means no cold water around Galapagos, or was there just a less active El Nino before? This is the key question and whether that is related to East African aridification because this sudden shift argument will say that this change from permanent El Nino to a less permanent El Nino or a episodic El Nino. Right now El Nino happens 2 to 7 years, right? whereas permanent El Nino means you have all the time warm waters. The main idea is that when you have an El Nino in the current configuration, East Africa gets a lot of rain. Okay? So the argument is that if there was a permanent El Nino, that means East Africa was very wet, that would explain the green forests and so on. So when it shifted to this cold temperature and the less frequent El Nino, that means East Africa got aridified. So that basically says that to figure out this change is very critical. Okay? Yeah. Is it simple to understand why during El Nino you get more rain in East Africa? Yes, basically the Hadley cell and Walker cell we looked at before. So cold water here, warm water here, rain is here. When El Nino happens, this shifts and then you get some shift here which makes it rain here. So the monsoon becomes drier, Indonesia and Australia become drier, but this becomes wetter. There are many other places that also become wetter. Okay? So El Nino affects basically the whole circulation. Okay? So then obviously you know what I am going to say. I am going to say that maybe Galapagos is responsible for this shift. So to briefly mention the geology of Galapagos, basically it is sitting on a plate called Natska plate which is basically moving eastward or southeastward and there is a mantle plume under it. So as the plate is moving steadily eastward, once in a while the plume cracks through the tectonic plate and produces a volcanic mountain. But as the plate moves, the volcanic mountain moves with it, but there is no supply of magma anymore because you have moved away from the plume. So the volcano becomes dead and either it collapses or it becomes a sea pillar or a, just an island. Okay? So similar hot plume islands are there in Hawaii also. Hawaii is also a similar uh, formation of islands. So basically that means you have to figure out how the configuration would have looked 1.5 to 2 million years ago. Okay? So we did that, but before that I will show how the circulation is affected by Galapagos in the present climate. 
So for that we basically looked at the distribution of rainfall and temperature. So this is a satellite temperature that is showing the eastern Pacific, here is again North America and South America. This is the rainfall distribution we looked at and this is something called chlorophyll which basically means we said there is upwelling here and more nutrients. So there is high chlorophyll on the equator here whereas where there is no upwelling you have very low chlorophyll. Okay? So if you look at the Galapagos Island which is so tiny, what you can do is take an ocean model and a climate model and in the numerical models you can either put in the island, you can move them around or you can take them out and see how the circulation changes, how El Nino changes and so on. Okay? So this is the model produced temperature when you have no Galapagos Islands. You just take out the island and you produce the sea surface temperature distribution. But when you put in the Galapagos in the model, you can see that it reduces the extent of the cold water, splits it around Galapagos and this is the satellite temperature. This looks more like the satellite temperature, right? So here these two are much more similar to each other than this one and this one. So this is the satellite temperature, okay? So this is what the observations look like. This is the reality, okay? There is a cold tongue here, it is split around Galapagos and there is cold water by the coast. Okay? So in the ocean model, when I do the simulation without having the Galapagos Islands, the temperature distribution looks like this. There is a lot of cold water, there is no splitting because there is no Galapagos. But I redo the simulation by putting in the Galapagos. Then you can see that now the sea surface temperature is not a perfect match, but it is much improved in the model compared to this simulation. Okay? So having the Galapagos makes the surface temperature distribution much more realistic. Okay? Basically because when you put in the island, the equatorial undercurrent that is coming in is hitting the island, is upwelling, producing a much colder upwelling but only close to the equator. The upwelling here is reduced because now the undercurrent is not coming to the other side anymore. So this is the difference which shows that the impact of the island is very local in terms of cooling, but it affects the rest of the Pacific because of the differences in this for, in this for example. Okay? So essentially this is saying that the Galapagos in fact has a very significant impact on ocean circulation even though it is tiny just because it is sitting on the equator and it is able to block this important equatorial undercurrent. Okay? So you can see that also looking at SST from satellites going from west to east, you can see that it is warm here as we saw, it is cooling and around Galapagos it suddenly drops significantly, then it warms to the east of the Galapagos back to the coast. And the production uh, in terms of chlorophyll, you can see that it is very low where the waters are warm, it jumps up very significantly just to the east, west of Galapagos drops to the east and then increase again to the coast. And you can see the currents here splitting around Galapagos and so on. So, yeah. As we know that uh, most of the deserts are uh, distributed near the equator. So, can we relate some of these effects to that also? Yes. So, actually if you lo look at the deserts, they are more like Sahara and uh, the Middle East and Mongolia is way further north. That is uh, slightly away from the equator. It is in something called subtropical uh, high pressure zones. So uh, in the tropics where the air is rising generally and sinking, so it is going east-west and north-south. So the sinking part of the north-south happens around 30 degree latitude. Okay? So that is where most of the deserts are. But you are right that if you look at uh, Galapagos where there is such cold water and no um, rainfall, then you do not have a forest on land. So Galapagos is a desert but ocean has a lot of upwelling. So ocean has a lot of biodiversity but land does not. So wherever there is, so this by the same token, 
where there is cold water along the coast here, this is all dry. So there is deserts over here. So this here rains only during El Nino because during El Nino this region is not cold. Warm water comes this way, it gets warm here and there is a lot of rain here. Okay? So yes, deserts are very much related to where it is cold. California is a desert, for example, if you look at sea surface temperatures, California coast is very cold. It is upwelling there. Okay? So yes, that is very important. So quickly, this is just showing that the same model can be used to see how the El Nino looks with and without Galapagos. So these are just basically showing sea surface temperature anomalies or deviations from the normal with and without Galapagos. So when you take out the Galapagos and when you put in the Galapagos, the El Ninos look different and this is what is called a power spectrum diagram and it is showing the frequency. So this is with Galapagos and this is without Galapagos. So basically it is saying that if there were no Galapagos, El Nino would be stronger but it would happen almost every other year. Whereas when you have Galapagos, it is happening more on a 3 to 4 year time scale. So in the current configuration, because Galapagos is there and it is hitting the equator, El Nino is happening on 3 to 4 year time scales. So if in the past Galapagos were not there or they were not hitting the equator, then it is possible that you had more El Ninos, more frequent El Ninos and stronger El Ninos. And we know that during an El Nino there is more rain on East Africa. That would explain why there was lush green forests. Okay? That means you have to do some geologic modeling and this is just the corresponding change in productivity. This is showing chlorophyll in grams carbon per meter squared per year from the model simulation for 60 years and you can see that the productivity also is very different in the tropical Pacific when you have El Nino or when you have no El Nino. Yeah. So this uh, model result that you found where you did not have Galapagos, yeah. even there you have this non-El Nino structure, right? Uh, the mean state is always cold in the east and warm in the west. So even in this other theory which talks about permanent El Nino, even there you, that's the mean. So this is the permanent El Nino state. All they are saying is the warm water is still here, but this is much warmer. So the current configuration, this is about 20, 22 degrees, whereas in there, here it is like 26, 27 degrees. And in your simulation without this island, yeah. there you get this state or no, you do not get this state? The permanent El Nino state? No, here we are just showing the, the mean state. So we are using modern day forcing. Oh, you so already described that uh, right. further away right. in the right. one. Okay. Right. Okay. So those are kind of details that uh, you do not have to worry about. So let us close out by looking at some geologic modeling. So how does geologic modeling work? Basically the ships measure gravitational anomaly and you can look at the, the dating of the existing volcanoes, uh, volcanic islands and you can then uh, assume some erosion rate of the volcanic magma loading as you go back in time. And then you can use the plate flexure, movement of the plate, subduction of the plate and so on. And you can reconstruct the past configuration of Galapagos Islands. So here it is basically starting with the current configuration going back half a million years ago, 1 million years ago, 1.5 million years ago and 2.5 million years ago. For reference, the current island that is crossing the equator is put in a shade, beige shade here. And you can see that 2 million years ago, all the islands were away from the equator. So the equatorial undercurrent was not blocked. It could go all the way to uh, the South American coast, which definitely would change the uh, El Nino or the temperature here. And 1.5 million years ago, the first islands, Banco Tuzo and uh, Salvo appear. And you can see that the UC is, is getting blocked. So since about Somewhere between 2 million years ago and 1.5 million years ago, the equatorial undercurrent got blocked, which is what changed the production and because of the upwelling changes, which is what produced that shift that we saw in East African temperature. And 
the main argument is that it is a very local change. It is not because El Nino changed or something, it is just because the equatorial undercurrent got blocked and it changed the upwelling locally and potentially because of that it changed the frequency of El Nino from maybe 2 years to 4 years which potentially could have changed the rainfall pattern on Africa and it could have changed the vegetation structure and it could still have affected human evolution through this bipedalism uh, process etc. So, this is just showing multiple proxies of sea surface temperature anomalies going from about 4 million years ago to the present and you can see that they all show this sudden shift uh, around 1.6 million years ago or so. Yes, Argo? Uh, so, if you go back. Yeah. So, here do you take into account like the ocean mean sea surface, I mean ocean level, that is also most of the time is 100 meter lower than today. So, if you look at all these small islands, we are yeah. probably looking at the 0 meter now. So, do you correct for that? Yes. Is they, shallow correct? Actually, yeah, that was the question also raised during the paper. Uh, essentially what you are doing is no matter what the sea level, the islands are evolving because of geologic process. So, all you worry about is whether it is coming above the water or not. Yeah, but the water level is yeah. plus minus 100 so, meters. So, and if you just plot 100 meter minus 100 meter contour here, yeah. would it still be blocking for example, maybe 2.5 million years ago? No, because you have to date the islands. The island? I am saying what you have shown here with this black yeah. uh, color, yeah. it is all above present sea level. Is it true or not? Should you worry the, about the. These are just the islands that existed at the time yes. and it only matters whether they were blocking the equator. Right. So, no, what I am saying in this, let us say this two, mil, 2 million year plot, if I plot in the same same thing, yeah, it the minus matter. 100 meter contour. Yeah. It, it, if, even if you drop the sea level by 100 right. meters. It will still be non blocking There is still no blocking of the equator. Yeah. That's so all I am saying is that like yeah. you have to worry about the topography below the ocean. Yes. So you, yeah. yes. you have taken it the whole model considers the plate movement, its flexure, loading of the islands, where they are, how high they are. So, they could be sub aerial or just under the water, it does not matter. Basically, equatorial undercurrent is from 200 meters to the surface. So, as soon as long as you are above that, you are fine. So, the sea level drop is considered here in the sense the if they are blocking above 200 meters, then yes, otherwise no. Okay? Very good. So, this is confirming that when you look appropriately, there is a shift 1.6 million years ago. If you look at the change in the temperature between east of the Galapagos and west of the Galapagos. So, the shift was not just from west Pacific to east Pacific as I showed before, but it is actually a jump across the Galapagos because when Galapagos blocked the equator, upwelling happens. To the west, you cool a lot and to the east, you actually reduce the cooling. So, that jump actually happened around 1.6 million years ago. So, this kind of confirms that people have been taking a core here and a core to the west of the Galapagos and interpreting it as a sudden jump. Whereas, if you take a core to the west of the, to the east of the Galapagos and take the difference, then actually the change is much more gradual. It is not a sudden jump. This sudden jump only comes when you subtract the west of Galapagos temperature proxies from the west Pacific. So, this confirms the argument that maybe there was never a permanent El Nino. It was just that temperatures were warmer, but they slowly gradually cooled and the apparent jump that has been misinterpreted is basically related to the fact that the islands evolved in a way to block the undercurrent around 1.6 million years ago. So, that locally changed the gradient across the Galapagos. It was very local cooling, it did not really change so much the east west gradient. Okay? So, that is kind of the main story. So, you can see that even though it is a tiny, tiny island compared to the big Pacific Ocean, just because of where it sits, 
it can have such a big impact on local circulation and potentially also on El Nino by the impact of ocean circulation, definitely on the, the biological production and biodiversity and so on. So these are some early experiments with a uh, climate model to impose those temperature changes and see if in fact you can get a signal on East Africa. So this is basically East Africa showing that you can create a warming by the Galapagos impacts and you can create a precipitation signal by having the Galapagos appear at a certain point. Okay? So this is an example because for example Indian Ocean has lots of islands. All islands create some kind of a microclimate by affecting circulation around themselves. How significant the impact of the island is depends on how the mean circulation around the island is. For example, the Madagascar impact is quite big, it is a big island, but even the Maldives which seem relatively small, if you look carefully in, in sea surface temperature images and ocean chlorophyll images, you can see some signal there. It is a rich fisheries ground, right? basically because locally it can create upwelling, support phytoplankton, zooplankton and fish and so on. So all islands are a local refuge of some sort against global warming, but with sea level rise, all islands are likely to experience some loss of land, etc. So we have to kind of combine the ocean circulation impact, biological impact, sea level rise, etc. when we look at islands. It is just that Galapagos is, is so important and it seems to provide kind of a, a prototype to study to see how island effects work in the past, in the present and maybe under global warming. Okay? I think I will stop there. Uh, the absence of Galapagos few uh, further years back, does this also have influence on the recharge and discharge mechanism of ENSO? Yes, absolutely. So what he is talking about is uh, if we look at this one, when we say uh, there is cold tongue here and we said that is because the water is moving away from the equator and the atmosphere is putting heat, so ocean is collecting heat. This is called a recharge, so ocean is recharging itself and that depends on how st strong the upwelling is because that determines how much heat is being taken up by the ocean, correct? So if you change the cold tongue, you will also have effect on the winds, you will have the effect on the heat being taken up by the ocean, hence you will have an effect on the recharge of the heat which means also affects the discharge. Basically discharge is when the warm water moves east and El Nino happens during which time the ocean is warm, so it is not taking up as much heat, so it is actually losing heat. So during an El Nino actually a little global warming happens. If you look at global mean temperature during an El Nino, especially the strong ones, global mean temperature goes up, right? That is global warming. So yes, the whole recharge discharge process, hence the El Nino cycle is affected by uh, the And also the propagation of waves like downwind cannon waves or? So the wave energy is potentially affected but the scale of the islands is much smaller than the scale of the waves. So you, in the current configuration for example, if you look at sea level from satellite, you can easily see the Kelvin wave going all the way to the coast of South America and then going north and south. So obviously it is not seriously being affected by the islands. Okay? It depends on the scale, the, the Kelvin wave scale is couple of hundred kilometers whereas Isabella is only crossing the equator by about 25 kilometers. So the waves are just going around it. Yeah. Is there any like high resolution proxy of this power spectrum of El Nino that can tell you that this transition happens? Yeah. <laughs> this is the something we are struggling with in the sense that in a very productive region like this, the sediment that is collecting is something like maybe one centimeter for 100 years if you are really, really lucky. If you go in the west, it will be like one centimeter for 1000 years. So this rate of sedimentation, how much biological dust is falling down depends on how productive the ocean is. But no matter what you do, you will never get El Nino time scales. But for several hundred years, you can get it from corals and so on. 
So, if you have a cold coral that is buried that is few million years old, you can date it and for that period of few thousand years, you can presumably get high resolution records. So, people are looking for them, but a lot of it is focused on the Holocene because we do not even know how El Nino has changed over the Holocene. And it is important because we want to know how global warming will affect El Nino and the best way to know what might happen is to know what has happened. So, we do not have a very good handle on what has happened in the Holocene. Some paleo proxies say it has become stronger, some say nothing has changed and so on. So, that is kind of the key issue. Can you ever come up with a proxy that can resolve those time scales? If this El Nino two types of scenarios, do they have some power in some low, lower frequency part of the spectra that you can? I mean something like Pacific decadal oscillation is related to decades which have more El Ninos and decades which have less El Ninos. So, you can theoretically pursue something like that, but right now we do not have a mechanism to understand exactly how this works. Right? So, yeah, but that is you will need some thinking like that. The what is the low frequency signature of El Nino? Is it in the monsoon? Is it in East African river rain? Uh, like some of the river flows uh, have signatures in organic matter or titanium and so on. So, people are exploring all sorts of things, but still the time scale you can resolve is still kind of very coarse. As you told that scientists uh, they have developed a technique to uh, drill down the sediment. So, uh, did any drilling happen near Galapagos Islands? Yeah, yeah. The proxies I showed here. There are several around Galapagos. So, there is some to the west, some to the east, some to the south. So, yeah, there are several cores in the East Pacific. And I think they are doing more now because under global warming, there is a debate about whether the East Pacific will warm or cool. Remember the very first uh, figure I showed where Argo uh, asked what I am showing here. So, these are the trends, right? So, this is saying that the East Pacific is cooling while the rest of the ocean is warming. This is very critical because if the ocean is able to cool under global warming, that means it can absorb the heat. Okay? So, we call it the ocean dynamic thermostat, which means if you try to put heat into the atmosphere by greenhouse gases, then the ocean will increase its heat uptake, which will be very nice. So, to understand if that is how it worked in the past and so on, people are trying to do more work uh, in the critical region of the East Pacific where uh, you need to figure out exactly what is happening. And if at all that happens then whatever effect we have generated because of greenhouse or global warming that could be nullified to certain extent. Uh, Slow down like for example, ocean uh, will, ocean has a huge depth, huge heat capacity, but it will not keep it forever. Eventually it will give it back. So, the whole process of global warming can be kind of uh, mitigated for some time. It can be slowed down, but it cannot be eliminated because the energy is still in the system. You are not throwing it back to space. You are keeping it within the system and it can always come back. And if you do not know when or where it will come back, then it can become another problem. right? Plus, when you are putting heat into the ocean, it is expanding. So, sea level is going up anyways. So, there was a slide between ITF and the glaci uh, glaciation. Yeah. So, uh, I think I missed out the explanation for that. This one? Yes. Yeah. So, basically this study from Kane and Molnar said that Australia is moving north right now. So, in few million years it will be in Japan and they will be eating sushi. But right, if you go back in time, 3 to 5 million years ago it would have been south of the equator. So, this whole passage would be open. So, then you would have continuous flow here. The warm pool and the cold tongue everything will look a little bit different and the rainfall here would look different. But as it moved and around 3 million years ago as it touched the equator and uh, removed the barrier or uh, imposed a barrier it basically created a barrier the so called equatorial waveguide was blocked right so in that case instead of water just being straight across the equator you created the indonesian through flow to go through 
and that changed the sea surface temperature in the Indian Ocean, right. You probably already learned that Indonesian through flow changes the Indian Ocean. So, the Indian Ocean temperature would be very different if you did not have the waveguide versus when you blocked it, okay. So, this is arguing that the cooling of the Indian Ocean. So, essentially when you uh, blocked the passage, then the Indian Ocean cooled. Theoretically, when you cool the Indian Ocean, you will reduce the rainfall over East Africa, but it turns out they were slightly wrong because the cooling has to happen near the equator, whereas this cooling is happening in around 20, 10 to 15 degrees south. So, this theory is actually not so accepted anymore, but it is something to consider, okay. How did… Basically initiating glacial cycles. No, this, you don't, this is no, nothing to do with glaciation. This is just for understanding whether the blockage of the path produced cooling of the Indian Ocean and the reduction of rainfall over East Africa. You do not need glaciation here. And also the West Indian Ocean and Eastern Indian Ocean are having different effects because of ITF. Because when ITF is flowing, so it is bringing warm water and it is increasing the ocean heat content of Southern Indian Ocean at least. So, the parts of Indian Ocean are having different results because of ITF. Yes, Indonesian through flow definitely affects the Indian Ocean. Yeah. yeah. But differently yeah. in different regions. Yes and no. I mean, it is not that detail is not important in this case because it is coming in the southern part of the Indian Ocean. Hence, it has impact on the southern part. Does not mean it has a different impact on the other part. It is just that it has an impact on the southern part, not on the other parts. That is all. Okay. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.